and what we're going to talk about is just slightly different. Um, this is the title of our session, Foundational Sources, Assessing Quality and Learning to Work with Universities. Uh, we're definitely going to talk about learning to work with universities, because this is the partnership track. Um, but we're really also just going to kind of give you a lot of ideas of where you can find research as well, um, because there's a lot of sources out there um, that are really applicable, I think, and helpful. So the work quickly in um, bicycling and walking, we want to highlight some of those. So I want to take the moment, we're going to kind of, um, we have one integrated presentation that we're each going to kind of talk about different, at different points of, so I want to go ahead and introduce the co-presenters. Um, so Kristen Brookshire is a research associate at the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center, um, HRSC. HSRC. Mm -hmm. oh, HSRC? <laughs> we're going to really try to be light on acronyms and we're probably going to fail, yeah. um, as I've already done. Um, and Connor is a senior planner at Kills and Associates. So uh, we're just going to start with a little bit about kind of the importance of evaluation um, and then talk through how you might approach doing evaluation or research in your own local context. Um, but at the end of that, you should be a little kind of on purpose. You might be a little overwhelmed by kind of going into this or realizing that. So really we want to talk to you about where to find other research. Um, the people that really do research as a full-time job um, are doing. So we'll talk about completed research, ongoing and needed, and then also talk about uh, engaging with universities and just kind of trying to open up a little bit of the black box of how university research works and how it's structured, particularly mostly in transportation. So I'm gonna start with this to say, trust us, we're not experts, um, which is probably a little odd, and purposely <laughs> tongue in cheek. Uh, but the three of us all pretty much spend a lot of our time doing research, but we are not, uh, we really learned it on the job, a lot of us. None of us have PhDs, um, so we really uh, wanted to try to embark some of the knowledge that we've learned by being on the research side over the last uh, five to ten years, and to really say that also what we're really interested in is getting the research into communities and having it really affect practice. We're not really in this for the citations or publications. Um, we're in it to make sure that um, knowledge becomes power and we have better communities. So uh, I wanted to start with a little bit about talking about kind of research in public policy and urban planning. So yeah, research is a very different um, beast in a lab, right? Um, you control everything. You're just looking for small, bits of pieces, and the cities are inherently messy. And while we're really interested in research and evaluation in the city as our urban lab, there's just so much stuff going on there, right? There's economic forces, political factors, demographic changes, and a lot of these are very typically totally outside of the scope of whatever you're trying to actually look at. So um, just to kind of as a caveat to say that, you know, in research you're always trying to control for everything else besides what you're looking at, and it's very difficult to do so when you're in an urban or rural, just kind of when you're out in space. Um, so just to kind of remember, there's probably a lot of things that are outside of what you're currently looking at that may be kind of affecting your evaluation. So um, sometimes, you know, a lot of times we see like on the APP lister or um, we talk to people in practice, they you know, say like, Oh, you know, are you, what are you doing research on? Oh, I want to know about what the city's doing. Did they look at it? Did they evaluate it? And it's actually kind of hard to find. Um, and in addition, it's difficult to conduct. So um, I think the first point is that a lot of times planners and engineers generally don't conduct post hoc evaluations of their work. You know, it's not usually in the project life cycle, while it ideally would be. Um, it's sometimes outside of the scope, whether it's the funding. Um, and there's another uh, uh, reasons of that. So while it would be really great, and we're going to talk about at the end of the presentation, a way that you can actually kind of use your work to at least feed back into the research life cycle, there's just not actually a lot out there from practice itself. The second part is that there are evaluation models, and they do exist, but they're kind of ill-defined. Part of why, like I said plain earlier, that it's really difficult to control and difficult to operationalize. A lot of places have different data, you have different technologies, and there's not really a very standard way to approach uh, evaluation, particularly as you move into more innovative treatments um, and projects that look different in different places. And lastly, I think that there's a lot of reasons that are sort of disincentives to actually conduct evaluation. 
So cost is a big part of it. To do an evaluation, you want to usually need to get a lot of people. Uh, you want to pay those people for their time. Um, and then politics. It is not easy to say, we're, you know, we, while we do this lot of pilot projects, we're going to look at it, we're going to figure it out. You do set yourself up to risk of saying, we tried this and it didn't work. So just as the fact that uh, that kind of is a bit of a barrier. So not to fault that, you know, there's not a lot of evaluations out there, just to try to explain that there's reasons as to why that happens. Uh, so okay, so if you kind of overcome all of that, why would you do it in the first place? And I think there's two big reasons, and it's important to think about, not just about, you know, I want to know what actually happened, but a bit of it is about promoting accountability. So a lot of it is discussions with the public, um, people who feel like they want to see how their tax dollars were done, um, or about stakeholders, about kind of government initiatives, and so just to kind of get a wide range of being transparent to the public. And the other one is to actually improve government management. So there's kind of the external, which is showing to people in your constituents about how you're doing and what you're learning, and the other is to actually improve your internal processes and to do better in the future. So uh, the idea now, I'm just going to kind of walk through a little bit about the research process. And the point I want to start with is every research starting starts with a question. And it's very difficult to think of one that you don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to come up with a research question that is a non-leading question. So I um, critique a lot of agencies that say, oh, well, we want to find out what are the benefits of our work. And like already, you're leading right there, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, what are the effects? What happened? And it's really difficult because you, you're trying to do good. You're trying to have projects that have positive outcomes. But to really do evaluation in a very honest and thoughtful way starts at a point that has a question that you don't know the answer to. So, um, and part of it is that, you know, just defining your problem statement. And um, that kind of starts with where your project came from, um, why you really did the project in the first place. Then to have an understanding of how others have approached the problem. So, um, and the tricky part about this is that we see a lot of evaluation studies. I, personally, I think the New York City DOT probably does some of the most um, internal studies and evaluation, but there's actually not a lot of methodology about how they've done that. And so it's really difficult to even figure that out. So uh, hopefully using networks like APPP or just relying on other people to figure out how they've actually done that is a really part uh, of the research approach. Or if you're on a more empirical side, that's what we call the literature review. Like, right? Like, how do we? What do we know about this topic, and how do people methodologically uh, approach this in the past? Then the next step is actually designing and deploying your data collection approach. Um, and every time, it takes a lot more people and a lot more data points than you would expect. And uh, just the it's a non-significant part of just kind of coordinating all of that. Um, performing critical analysis. And the last part I think is, you know, why I personally am really interested in research is to present very clear, written, verbal, and visual results of your work. So to me, since um, I don't really uh, write a lot of like academic papers that are going into peer-reviewed journals, I'm trying to really kind of write a technical report and then have a policy brief. Um, come to present, come to conferences like this and talk about this. Work with some graduate students to really create some visual identity about the work, <coughs> and then that's just as important as all the steps before that. So um, there's a lot of ideas about how what you're actually comparing. Um, sometimes we look at experimental versus control. So experimental um, is like, well, we did a pedestrian plaza in neighborhood X, and then we're going to compare it to our control neighborhood Y. Um, and it's really difficult, kind of going back to the beginning, because there's so many other things, and it's really that no two neighborhoods are really alike. And to really create kind of experimental versus control, it's a pretty big research design that requires that. Um, and um, you need to kind of try to be even about doing that. And in most cases, you probably haven't actually put out your experiment in a lot of enough places to really to compare it. So more commonly, we're really looking at kind of before and after points and how did the space change? What are the outcomes of the project? Most of the time, if you're going to be performing successful research, uh, you want to really hone down on some short-term effects. 
Um, a lot of the research I've been doing lately has been about open streets programs. So we have like Sokovia or Slovia in Los Angeles. Um, and people really want to know, well, we have tens of thousands of people coming out. Is this contributing to behavior change? You know, like people, are people riding their bikes more? Are people taking transit more? Those are great questions. But those long-term effect studies are nearly impossible to do, and you really have to have a very high level of research funding. So I think part of being honest and, and doing this is really saying, well, what are the short-term effects really before and after? And then to kind of go back why the project was conceived. So what were the intended outcomes, and are they even, were they even really measurable in the first place? So I think this kind of goes to really, hopefully just doing um, projects that we set ourselves up for success. Um, so, an example, uh, is anyone here from LA Metro? Yeah, I'll use LA Metro then, for example. Um, <laughs> so, in Los Angeles, we had a recent uh, ballot initiative to try to raise tax funding for our subway project, and they called it the Traffic Relief Program, right? And I'm not sure, based on what we know, that really putting more transit out there is really relieving congestion for people. So it's a way to say, if you want to call your project something, make sure it's something that you can measure and that you know it's going to do. So a lot of times, just a lot of different act, um, activities kind of put into the bucket of a particular project. We're going to promote economic development. Well, what does that actually mean, right? I think that that's a really good way to say, well, we're going to be able to measure this at the end if we set ourselves up for success in the beginning. There are kind of two buckets. There may be others. We're really interested in, um, in the discussion to think about there's other places. But there's kind of one is behavioral responses to change. So things like traffic counts. Uh, we see a lot with road diets, road configurations. You can also see travel time surveys, which I think is a, kind of a very interesting way to do that. Collision analysis. And then there's the other, which is kind of perceptions of change. So we see this a lot with our survey work, uh, business interviews. So you know, looking at before and after, like, well, what did people um, in the community really think the project was going to do beforehand, and then how did their perceptions change afterwards? And I think those are um, really helpful uh, ways of thinking, and they're different, and they're both totally legitimate. So I want to talk really quickly just to compare that. When we're talking about research, we're not just saying you have to do a quantitative analysis. Um, so I want to just quickly compare kind of quantitative and qualitative approaches. In a quantitative analysis, you're trying to kind of explain something or predict something. You want to test a theory. You have a question that you don't know the answer to, but you could have a hypothesis about what the answer might be. You hopefully have a at least fairly large sample, um, but you're not asking a lot of questions, right? You're just usually having multiple choice or short um, short responses, you generally want to be using standard instruments, so the same survey or the same data collection approach with everyone, and then you're doing a deductive analysis. In qualitative research, um, you're really, it's a very different uh, approach, but you really you get different, um, there's pros and cons to each of them. So you have kind of, uh, rather than, you have an explanation, and you kind of describe it, really, you know, what is that? You're trying to build a theory. You're probably going to have a smaller sample, but you can get a lot more depth about this. Uh, your observations are more like the interviews, and they're probably open-ended. And where those actual conversations go is a really interesting way to kind of arrive at your answer. So um, with Open Streets, we've done, everyone's really interested in the business effects of these projects. And I've done the same research in both of these ways. We do have some quantitative analysis about um, at two data at two time points about sales um, from be the Sunday before the event and the day of the event. But we only have that one data point. I have it for about 250 businesses. We've seen some patterns, um, and we can talk about it. But there's it's, in the end, it's only relatively interesting. In a couple other places um, where we knew that it was going to be really hard to get the business participate for a number of reasons, we changed to a qualitative approach and did uh, interviews before and after and really saw so much more. What we heard from people in that one was that, um, you know, oh, this actually might not be great for my business, but this is great for the community. Um, and they really saw themselves as a community stakeholder, and that was something we would just never find out in the quantitative analysis. So if you have an opportunity, and that's why to actually do these both ways, there's pros and cons, and you're going to get different things out of them. 
So, um, as a caveat, I just want to say, don't sweat sample size. Um, you're going to get whatever you get. You really typically have a very short window, usually in whatever project you're doing, to really go out there and get it. And then it's kind of either the project goes in or something has changed. Um, so while you might want to try to get to like a representative sample or something like that, you can totally um, you know, work with what you have. The second part of my tip about how I would tell people others to do this is just run descriptive analysis, at least kind of the first cut. So you get a bunch of stuff, you get it all in, and then you're like, okay, how do, what am I going to do with this? And just to kind of run, you know, this is called descriptive, so just like minimum, how much range is there in your data? Like if you're looking at, um, you know, in the businesses, we saw a really big range. So while we could average it, it really hid a lot of what was going on there. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff there. And you can kind of start to see a story emerge. And this is the third part of what I tell my students. What I do, I, I get the luxury of doing a lot of my job, is just looking at your data and just trying to find the narratives. What is really going on there? Um, you know, what narratives start to emerge? Because that's what you're trying to get data to do, is to tell you the story. And then if you do have a good enough um, sample size, starting to look at the responses between different groups. I think is a really interesting way. And then, so how did men versus women answer? How did younger versus older? Um, and to actually kind of usually even collapse some of your data. So you might have like ages, you have all these different age buckets. You can kind of put them into smaller categories like, oh, here's a 20 year, um, you know, younger, older, um, and comparing that. And there's a lot there. Um, in the open streets, we did all of the surveys at the events. And so one of the interesting group analysis we did was about the arrival between people that came to the event with kids and people that came without kids. And it was super interesting because it was actually the same. And um, that was something that was really unexpected, but that we wouldn't be able to tell if we hadn't actually looked at that. And the other way would be to look at the answers between questions. So I've also done a bit of parklet research. And uh, so we're asking people like where they're from. And then we could say like, Oh, people who come to this area really frequently want seating, and people that don't come really frequently want parking, um, as an example, right? And that's that's another way to see just relationships between the different things you're looking at um, that can also start to tell you a story. And then the hardest, kind of the hardest part, is just to creating simple tables and charts from the most telling, uh, interesting, or surprising information. You can have a giant appendices that talks about everything. Um, but the most effective way is to really say, well, this is what was really telling to me and to start to pull out that narrative. So some of the pitfalls that I, that I see come up is, um, and, and this is where I become a really nitpicky academic, is uh, talking about relationship versus the correlation versus the causation. So you might see that there are relationships between different things. like. How far away from a project, you know, defines how what modes people are going to take. You know, people that live really close, walk. Then there's like relationships there. Um, if you're talking, really looking for a correlation, you need to be running at least a very basic statistical test to really say that with confidence. I think um, because if you don't, if you say, oh, here's a correlation, but there's not actually, you know, haven't run any basic statistics, you're really seeing a relationship, and that's totally fine. I think it's just best to be honest about that. And the causation part is definitely the trickiest. It's always what we want to get to, but there's just so much that goes on there. Um, it's really difficult to actually say one thing caused another. The second pitfall I would say is um, no finding is still a finding. So um, pretty much of all of our business survey research, we come out with about a 0% change in business sales. And that's, that's fine. That's, I mean, there's a really interesting narrative that you can take thousands of cars off the street and business doesn't really change. And that's great. The, uh, my funder doesn't really like to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe after this, I'll, I'll write the paper and it'll get hidden behind some academic paywall and I can actually say that. Um, but, um, you know, oh, did you think you were going to change hearts and minds and everyone's just kind of fine with it? That's fine. Do you have mixed results? I mean, I think that we, it's part of being uh, very honest with what you're doing is just to um, say, we went out to look to find something and we did it. Um, that's also why it's very difficult to do this as a government agency because 
it might feel like a failure. And that's kind of leads to the third part, which goes to these other two, which is just not really documenting the assumptions of limitations. I think it's best to be very open about what you're looking at um, and saying what you assumed, you know, maybe it's a small sample, maybe, um, you know, the weather was really bad and you only had one data collection day, whatever it is, just kind of documenting that because it's easy for people to poke holes in what you're doing if you haven't been very complete. Um, one of the things I see a decent bit in um, doing paper reviews or I, I teach GIS and I, I tell my students this, is that they come up with some conclusion, but it's not actually tied to what they found in the project. Um, you know, maybe something they want the project to do, but just to be, um, every kind of conclusion you have should be directly tied to something you found. Um, so that's kind of hopefully maybe scared you a little bit, um, or hopefully maybe even opened up a little back box of it. So I want to give it over to uh, Kristen, who's going to, wait, who are we going next? Connor, um, who's going to talk a little bit about where to find research in other places. Right, so just going to reiterate um, Madeline's preface up front that we're not experts. Um, I'm going to talk now about where, where to find research and a little bit about where research comes from. And there's not, uh, in our experience, a place you can go to learn this cleanly. And so we've sort of cobbled this together through our, you know, through what we, what we understand and then want to convey that along to you. Um, so I'm going to cover the first few sections of this and then Kristen is going to uh, pick up at the Headbike Information Center. Uh, so there's, talking about different different places that research in the U.S. anyway comes from, uh, particularly at the federal level, uh, from, from USDOT and um, associated federal and, and state agencies. Um, but beginning first with, with USDOT, the, the Department of Transportation actually invests a lot of money in research every year, over billions of dollars every year in, in transportation related research. Not all of that is Surface transportation was the type of, certainly not all that relates to bicycles and pedestrians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a considerable amount, considerable amount of money that they're spending in trying to make sure that we're, you know, the US, U.S. is running the most efficient and productive transportation system possible. Uh, and Madeline said at the beginning that we'll try not to have too many acronyms. My section here is lousy with acronyms, I apologize. Uh, but, you know, so DOT is the, is the umbrella, and within that they have four modal administrations aviation, highway, rail, and transit. Uh, most of what pet and bike things deal with come through Federal Highway Administration. And so that's what I'll spend a little bit more, well, I'll spend I'll only some time talking about that of the four. Um, and then there's also sort of another body called NHTSA, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration, FHWA um, has over $400, $400 million annually in research. And uh, this was one that took me a long time to sort of understand exactly how it worked. But they, they fund these research projects through what they call IDIQ contracts, which are indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. And there's usually only five or six contractor teams that have access to these contracts, although their teams expand beyond that. Um, and they're, they're with a different, with a specific office. So Office of Safety funds a lot of research that's related to, what, to pet, pet and bikes and Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty. Um, and the third one that does a lot of, spends a lot of money is Office of Operations, although it tends to be less focused on, on walking and um, And FHWA has, has done this forever, but in recent years they've really started spending a lot of effort um, on ped pedestrian and bicycle transportation. And much of that is coming out of the Office of Human Environment Livability Team. So that's an office within the planning of the Office of Planning. Um, and I don't know, you, you hope many of you have seen some of these publications. This is just a selection of the things that have come out of the, this group, the, the Ped and Bike program, in just the last five years or less. So it's Three? Yeah. Two and a half? Yeah. <laughs> the last, right. Yeah, the Separated Bike Lane Guide was 2015. That's right? the first of yeah. those four. So um, they, the FHWA was the first federal agency to publish guidance on separated bike lanes or cycle tracks. Um, and then, the, you know, they just keep doubling down and, and, and doing more and more. Um, and continue to do so. So it, it's, it's really encouraging to see that it's, it, it is really powerful to go in, I, I meant to start off, so I'm a consultant, my co-presenters are at research institutions, and I'm, I'm a consultant working in research but also in practice and, and on, on the ground. And so 
often needing to cite research. And if you can bring a document that has FHWA's name on it, and they say this is how to do bike facilities, and, and it's being done right, uh, it's really powerful. Um, Office of Safety um, has done a lot of work. They, they really are trying to understand how countermeasures, you know, safety countermeasures, are working for, for all modes, but especially pedestrians and bicycles. They've done research that's helped get um, um, helped, help people understand the impacts of things like rapid, rapid flash beacons and um, hyper beacons. And Office of Safety is also related to the Everyday Counts Initiative. Have people heard of that? Everyday Counts. It's um, it's FHWA's way of trying to get research out in, into the into practice. So they'll choose a topic that is of, of relevant interest for a given time. I think it's a year at a time, maybe a little less. And then do webinars and, and conferences and get people together thinking about this. So they recently did road diets was their focus. And so FHWA is out disseminating information on road diets and helping people understand, helping state DOTs in particular understand where those might be appropriate and how to get them. So NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, is um, also another, another arm of the federal of the US DOT that is advancing transportation research and has a lot of, a lot of thinking in PEDS and bikes, um, as it says here, particularly focused on behavioral research. So a lot of what NHTSA is doing think, is focusing on um, education and enforcement campaigns and, um, sorry, <laughs> um, in, in, in helping agencies, DOTs think about what uh, what they might be able to achieve through that, and you know, the answer, unfortunately, is not really that much. So for the most part, but, um, don't only do this. Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so that's um, some of the sources of, of federal USDOT research, um, and I wanted to segue for a minute into where to find research. As Madeline mentioned. You will all often see questions posted to listserv and um, for things that there probably or we know there is research out there, but it's difficult to put our hands on. And um, th there's some, there are some good tools, and, and there need to be more. One um, is the US DOT Research Hub. This is a nice one-stop place to go to type in your topic uh, and see what is listed there. This won't give you everything, but it will give you you know one half of your Venn diagram. Um, the second place that I think makes sense to always go to is the is TRID, the Transportation Research International Documentation. This will give you another Venn diagram, which will have a lot of overlap and a lot of things that only appear one or the other. Um, TRID is a sort of a relatively new research portal that combines the what, what a lot of people probably heard before was TRIS, Transportation Research Information Service, and then it brings in this international body of research. Um, in talking with my colleagues before this, I learned that it often relies on a pro proactive research, using a university librarian, research librarian, to get their university publications into these um, databases. So again, this is a place to start. It's not going to get you all the way there, but um, well, that's where I usually start my work, and then I'll probably ask someone who's in the field <laughs> working in the research more frequently. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about TRB. Um, how many people have been to TRB at the annual meeting in DC? About half of you. Have, who's, have everyone heard of it? Or, yeah. It's, it's um, probably it has to be the biggest transportation conference in, in annually. Uh, I think we're up over twelve thousand or thirteen thousand. Fourteen. Fourteen thousand people came this year. Um, it's a lot of transportation people. Not. Um, there's also you learn there's a lot of aspects of transportation that you don't think about. <laughs> Hot mix asphalt. Uh, particular. Uh, so, Transportation Research Board is part of the National Academies of Sciences, and it's obviously charged with transportation-focused research. And beneath TRB, there are uh, what was that, six different cooperative research programs, and this is where all of the all of the transportation research through National Academies is getting funneled. Um, and the first two, the focus on highways and transit, are the one that will have is doing research related to walking and biking and, um, and most of the surface transportation stuff that we're, that we're involved with. Um, so NCHRP, well, the next, yeah. So I'll, I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. The National Cooperative Highway Research Program, NCHRP, despite the word highway in it, is, is the place to, do, to go to get <coughs> bike and head focused research. Um, there, the NCHRP alone is, is funding 40 to $50 million a year. Um, and Every year, there's usually one or two 
head bike focus project, and then several more that have implications for walking and biking. And then the transit cooperative research program, TCRP, is a little bit like play funded, um, more lightly funded, and will occasionally have pedestrian bike topics. The things related to transit station access, for example, um, or also just street, street improvements that our uh, part focus on transit can have um, implications. Um, part, part of like sorting this out as we're preparing the presentation was thinking about an order to talk about this, and it's almost impossible because it all it's at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to come back to how these how the funds get here in a second. But um, one of the things we thought people might be interested in is how you can get involved in in research. And a way that with one of the lowest barriers to entry is getting active in TRB committees. So TRB has a committee focused on pedestrians and one focused on bicycles. And um, each of these committees, which have sort of rigid membership, uh, have subcommittees that are a lot more open and, and tend to have more opportunities for anyone who shows up at the meeting to volunteer to, to do something. But the primary role of the committees, there's two, there's two I'd say, primary roles of these TRB committees. One is to review and um, select papers for presentation at the annual meeting. So um, that's, again, they're looking to get involved. They're always looking for people to help review papers. Um, and the second is to help direct research, uh, future research. So um, the, the, one, one of the products of these, these committees is to develop research needs statements. And the research needs statements are what they sound like. It's a, it's a statement that identifies what is a topic that we need to know more about. How well do um, high visibility crosswalks work, right? And so you write a couple pages of how the, what the need is, and then that gets into, goes into a da database, um, which is searchable here, uh, which eventually might feed into a, a future NCHRP project, although um, there are many, many, many more needs than there are funding for projects. Um, this, this database is also used by students who are looking for capstone topics or um, looking for you know, research, research centers might pick these up independently as well. Um, and then uh, we, need to, we need to tie AASHTO back into all of this somehow. So AASHTO, uh, State Highway Transportation Officials, is, it is involved almost in every, in every portion of the research, the federal research work I've talked about. Um, AASHTO, so AASHTO represents state, state DOT, state transportation officials. The NCHRP program is funded by AASHTO. Uh, so, the federal, the, federal, the federal government gives money to the states, and the states give some of that to NCHRP to fund um, important research projects that advance their needs. Uh, and then the NCHRP goes away and comes up with a list of research needs statements that they think should be, become projects. They bring that back to AASHTO, and AASHTO actually does the selection of what projects get funded through a uh, balloting process. Um, AASHTO also sponsors research, research directly, like the, um, you know, the the bike, the bike design guide that has Ashto's name on it is, is paid for through an NCHRP project, but Ashto keeps their hands on the wheels or something. Like that. Um, so yeah, I apologize for all the back and forth, but it's just really murky and uh, trying to trying to sort this out for for us and for you. Um, so that I think um, enough of an overview on that. We can talk about more of the details maybe more of each other in the discussion section. But with that, I'll hand it back or off to Kristen yeah. to pick up. Uh, and I'll just thank Connor for taking on the uh, acronym stew for us. <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about how to find these original research studies, who's doing them. Not everybody has time or interest to go and find that original source study. So I'm going to talk about two clearinghouses that are operated by my, the research center where I work, the Highway Safety Research Center, um, which just like Connor mentioned, the highway is kind of a misnomer. Mm -hmm. All my work is focused on bicycle and pedestrian. Um, safety related programs. Um, so the first one of those is the Pedestrian Bicycle Information Center. Uh, it was started in 1999 um, and since then uh, HSRC along with the team has bid on it through a competitive process um, four times I think. Um, and so the mission of the Pedestrian Bicycle Information Center is to improve quality of life of communities um, 
through the increase of safe walking and biking as a viable means of transportation and physical activity. Um, and that's done by developing, synthesizing, and disseminating research and best practices and through by offering expert technical assistance. So this, this current iteration, which started in 2017, um, ITE, the Governor's Highway Safety Administration. Oh, it's a, something that's a little different this time too is that NHTSA is throwing in money, so there's a little bit more um, education and enforcement um, that will be a part of this five-year contract for cooperative agreement for um, PBIC. And so um, our partners are uh, ITE, Governor's Highway Safety Administration, People for Bikes, Tool Design Group, and the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Um, along with some individual consultants, and, up, and we coordinate with lots of other partners, all the acronyms, APA, PPP, APHA, NACTO, uh, America Walks. Um, we have coordinating calls um, with folks in all those or organizations too, so that um, we're on the same page. Uh, and so the disseminating research part, um, I'll make a little plug for our newsletter. That's the best way to find out when we have upcoming webinars and new resources. Um, but the way that we sh are sharing information is through monthly webinars. Um, this is you know, a range of topics from successful education and enforcement campaigns, Vision Zero, um, bike ped volume data collection, um, practices and technologies. Those are just some topics from this, this year. Um, and then info briefs, um, these are short, um, you know, five pages or less um, on a popular topic. So the last one we put out, um, which People for Bikes wrote, um, is about connecting bicycle networks. And then a, a deeper dive comes with our white papers. Um, and there's a few recent topics up there. Um, equity, crowdsourcing data, um, improving connectivity during the rehab of bridges, um, and automated enforcement technologies are all topics. These are, you know, we're synthesizing the research, usually like 10 or 20 pages, but it's something you, you know, want to sit down with and um, understand a little bit more. And then, so in addition to these, um, which are PBIC products, the PBIC website and our communications is also a way to share best practices that, um, and research that others are doing. And, um, and they may also be, things that people on our team worked on, but through some of the other contracts, like Connor mentioned, some of the IDIQs through the different FHWA offices, those products are all shared through PBIC as well. And so another clearinghouse is the Crash Modification Factors Clearinghouse. Has anybody in the room used this before? This side, all right. <laughs> you guys didn't see it. Everyone over there raised their hand. <laughs> how you expect safety to be improved if you put in a certain type of um, highway safety countermeasure. Um, I think the website also states it in terms of a crash reduction factor as well, so either, whichever one your agency is comfortable using. Um, and so these are often used um, to compare safety consequences across different alternatives, figuring out where you might get your greatest gain with limited funds, um, comparing results, um, from new analyses and then checking the validity of assumptions from uh, cost-benefit analyses. And so there are experts who are reviewing research as it comes out to um, give these countermeasures a, a five-star rating, um, to um, you know, the analyze the quality of the research. They're doing that all for you. So you can go into this website, use the search function, you know, everything's sorted by um, the crash type that you, affect, you might expect to be changed, the users involved, um, and so the search function is definitely something if you haven't um, explored before, I would uh, encourage you to check it out. Um, but the, I, I don't want to deter anybody from, you know, it takes a long time to develop crash modification factors too. Um, a recent report that was completed through NCHRP, it was NCHRP 17-56, which was to develop CMFs for um, a few different treatments that can be used at mid-block crossings um, to improve pedestrian safety. Um, and so those are in there now. If that's something that interests you, I you know, encourage you to go check that out. Um, but there
there is still a big wanted list um, within the clearinghouse as well. Um, this list, sorry if that's really faded out for you guys, um, is generated through the search function on the website. If someone types in chicanes and nothing pops up, we know that people are looking for that and it, we add it up. People are looking for this, huh? Clever. You're saying it's very clever. <laughs> Pretty low tech. <laughs> um, so, there, and there are a lot missing that have to do with um, bicycle and pedestrian crashes. So, um, you might not find what you're looking for, but it might encourage you to, you know, if you're if you're putting in some of these treatments, you can be the one that is providing the, the sites for the studies that'll come up with CMS. So, yeah. So, uh, Chris and I are just going to kind of talk through this a little bit. I'm going to talk about like where you can find university resources and kind of on the uh, side. So uh, this is the map of uh, where university transportation centers are located um, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, so the University Transportation Center program, um, I just want to talk briefly first about the research focus and their research mission and Chris is going to talk a little bit about the other parts of their work. So they're congressionally mandated and federally funded um, part of the federal transportation bill since the late 80s. And each center um, is a consortium of at least two universities. There is no uh, UTC that is at once one university um, at, of itself. And the, I just took this quote because I thought it was easier than me paraphrasing what they were trying to do. That they're trying to advance US technology and expertise in many disciplines comprising transportation through education, solutions-oriented research, and technology transfer, and explorers share cutting edge ideas and approaches. So um, while a lot of the um, part and parcel of UTCs are um, in their research, a big component is about what's called technology transfer, which is really dissemination. I mean, there are some parts where it's really like technology we're developing it, but it really just means getting the knowledge back out to people because they want to be very um, practical. <coughs> It's probably really confusing um, to the other people, and I just want to walk through a little bit of history of why it's so confusing. So um, every time that uh, the federal transportation, re so each time the new transportation author bill is reauthorized, um, and all of these centers have to read it. You immediately, like the, the, they exist for the length of that bill. So um, when they started, there was actually just 10 original research centers, and those were the regions. So these are the uh, federal, I think there's, there's nine federal regions, maybe there's a 10. 10? Yeah, so uh, 10 centered, and there were only these regional centers. Uh, and then in 1990, there were national centers. So this was uh, a couple of specific topics that were added into that. Um, and then in Safety Loop, on top of that, will become what was known as Tier 1 centers. I don't understand because there was never a tier two. Um, but really, it's they're also, so regional centers geographically organized, national centers are kind of national, are priority topics, and then tier ones are also kind of, uh, they're not necessarily geographically based. Uh, you could have a part of UTC tier one center that could have a partner in Virginia, Missouri, and California, um, and you probably do, so I'll tell you in a second. Um, and so that, that was the next group. Then in, um, like in the late 2000s, there was, a, there was a pretty poor job of a competitive process that was done. And there were a lot of centers that like kind of, people went and lobbied their Congress people and they got centers into the bill. So the number of centers exploded. All of a sudden there were 60 of them. Um, and then in the preceding MAP 21 and now the FAST Act, we've come down to about 30 of these centers. Um, and the confusing part is that the exact partners change and sometimes their names have changed as well. So. Um, for example, UCLA has been part of the Region 9 UTC since 1991, but we've been called UCTC, the University of California Transportation Center. In MAP 21, we were UC Connect, which I still don't even know what it stands for. Um, and now we're part of the Pacific Southwest Region Center. So, and each center has its own website. You have people that have maybe been involved in this, in faculty, and they're kind of in different places. So that's why it's really confusing also. There's tons of great research that have come out of these different centers, but you kind of have to go back in time sometimes. And I really try to get, like for example, our UTC, UCTC website, it's no longer, no longer funded, but there's so much good stuff there 
and they like didn't pay their internet bill. Um, I was like, you guys, can you like? So luckily, I had like student assistants that like went through the Wayback Machine and grabbed everything and archived it, and they eventually got it back up as well. Um, but yeah, so not only do we have the centers that exist now, there's tons of great resources um, and research that has been put out there in technical reports um, going back for the last uh, you know 25 years. I will add that those studies are probably not lost, though, because you might find them. I don't know how far back it goes, but you would find them in Research Hub or TRID. Yeah. UTCs, there's a really big reporting requirement, so they do not like live and die at the university. So yeah. It, but if you wanted to follow the institution over time, that would be hard. Yeah, it would be hard. And you'd be like, why is this is all the same people? Why does it have a different logo on it each time? This is <laughs> um, We actually, I think we have a really great um, group of UTCs right now. Um, part of it is, if you kind of notice in this map, there's a dot in every state. I wonder how that happens. So um, the competition process is really crazy. Pretty much a lot of it is determined by faculty that have worked together in the past, that have good working relationships. There's some strategic decisions that were made. Um, a lot of people, when Secretary Fox was still um, at the helm, thought it would be a really competitive idea to get a North Carolina partner on your team. Um, as you can notice, they did pretty well. Um, and so they're located a lot of places. You always have one university that's the lead, and you usually have a long list of partners, and that can totally depend. So um, there are regional centers that have to have focus, and then there's national. So I just want to kind of put this out to say, um, to kind of look to wherever your area is, and you can see what the center in your top, um, in your area. So these were, they kind of had priority areas um, that they put out, and you had to pick a priority area that you were responding to, and shoehorn whatever you wanted to do into that area. <laughs> um, and so you end up with that. So I'll talk a little bit about kind of the highlight, but there was an odd thing where not, um, there's supposed to be a national center in each topic area, and that didn't really happen. So actually, I think if you're in the bike head planning world, it kind of worked to your advantage uh, because there's duplicative national centers now. <coughs> Three I want to highlight in terms of national centers that would be important that you hopefully know now. Um, one is headed out of UC Davis, so the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. Um, their partners are kind of all over. I mean, there is a this is why it's very strategic when you get partners because you want to try to have your partners be in as many states as possible. <laughs> um, and then um, NITSI, which was formerly Ultra, which still might be. It's like really confusing on the name. So if you're confused. <laughs> Don't worry, we're on the inside, we're also confused. Um, but Portland State's the lead, they've always been very strong in this, obviously. And then at UNC, um, they have a road safety center. So um, there's just, there's really good centers out there. So uh, I want to talk a little bit, Connor, you can talk I guess we can all just, uh, so we want to just take a minute and talk about some of the things that are going on right now that I thought would be interesting to know about if you don't. Um, so I, I, I think we highlighted four up here. Um, so the Ashdod Bike Guide is currently being updated through an NCHRP contract. I think they expect the work to finish on that this year and hopefully have it published soon. Part of the ongoing, un un unending layers of comp complexity here, Ashdo has to approve the, the Bike Guide update before it gets published. Last time around, so the current Bike Guide that you've seen, which has the word, has 2012 written on it, the research for that guide was finished in 2009, and it took three years for Ashdo enough states, I'm not sure how, what proportion they need, for enough states to approve it through their balloting process before it was even published. So at the, the day it came out, it was three years out of date. And in, the, in, our, in our world, as you know, that's a long time. So there's hope this time it'll be faster, but it's not, um, I don't know. I, I would hold my breath for it. It could be the 2018 guide. Is what, it could is be the 2018 the... guide, yes. That's, that's the idea. It's supposed to be. Um, so. Um, Next one is an NCHRP top project on pit bike conflicts at intersections. Um, and since I'm working on this, I know that we um, selected to study protected intersections for this. So we're going to have, a, within a year or so, have a research publication out that talks about the safety and performance of protected intersections. And that should be, that should be really exciting to see some more research on this. Um, I think we identified there are 12 or 13 built in the US now, um, which is exciting. Um, 1773 is is it finished? Um, nearly finished. Anyway, uh, uh, another topic on pedestrian safety, looking at a lot of different pedestrian safety treatments, um, and and 
the last yeah. one I have on the screen here, yeah, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so this one's through the um, Office of Safety IDIQ, and it's um, just getting started, so it's recently awarded um, a resource guide on separating bicycles from traffic. So it's kind of taking the separated bike lane guide that Connor had on the slide earlier to the next level, giving practitioners a decision-making framework for, okay, you know, this separated bike lane guide showed what these designs could look like, but actually helping agencies make the decision of, you know, this type of road in our community, this is where it's appropriate. Um, so a little more technical in nature. Um, One of the gaps in guidance right now is when to apply. We're going a long ways on design, but when do you apply the different design treatments? Um, so this will be, I'll be, I'm really excited to see that come out. So um, a little bit more about university transportation centers. Um, all UTCs, they have their own research, research um, program manager or coordinator, um, and it's not, you know, a, it's not a black box. I mean, if you, if you have a, a university in your area, you look up, you know, on the map and see, you know, who's the tier one, or maybe there's a national center nearby, or maybe the national center is far away, but their topic area is really aligned with um, something you're interested in looking at. Um, the UTCs are open to hearing those research ideas. Um, and one advantage of the University Transportation Center program um, is the flexibility and the number of times that the call for projects comes up within the UTC. So Ma Madeline can jump in. I'm kind of speaking from what I know with our UTC. Um, but you know, there's, a, there's quick start projects that usually have like a one year turnaround. Um, and so if you hear of something you're going to see those, you know, a project getting underway. It's not going to be long until you see the, the results and the final report. Um, and those are sometimes led by junior level um, principal investigators. And then there's also going to be um, bigger projects that involve multiple consortium members. So the national UTCs have, you know, partners in many universities and sometimes within the university. Um, so at UNC, the Highway Safety Research Center is the lead, but we're also working with the Injury Prevention Research Center and the Department of City and Regional Planning within the university. Um, so I think every project is, no, it's never one university that's working on it. Maybe a quick start project would be like that, but it's, I think it's advantageous and, and it would be more competitive within that internal selection process if you're working with another university partner. Yeah, and a lot of it is how the research monies are. So I think one thing is that every, oh, well, you're going to talk about the cost match, but like at, for our Region 9, um, Caltrans provides a cost match, and then different partners kind of get an allocation of their research monies, and then you do an RFP that way. There's also multi-campus ones, but it's kind of different. So each UTC, I think, operates slightly different. We do most, most of the research out of that was out of UC Connect, that's been out of the Region 9 Center, is usually about a year and is at one university, while there are some multi-campus ones. Uh, yeah, so the cost match, every project you know, that it, UTC is working on has to have either a 50% or a 100% cost match, which means it, it can be a great you know, add-on if your agency um, or your organization is already doing a study, but there's this next level that you're curious about or this you know, offshoot that wasn't really within your scope or your funding, um, that partnering with the UTC that's focused on that topic, that could be an opportunity. Um, and it means that UTCs are always looking for partners um, because that, that match is part of every project. Um, and UTCs also have um, stakeholder or advisory boards. So um, this is providing direction to the UTC. Um, these are folks who are reviewing some of the research proposals, contributing their ideas, and reviewing the education programs and that the UTC is proposing and the final report that they're putting out as well. Um, and so, Madeline talked a little bit about the purpose of the UTC. Um, this is the website for the HSRC one just because it shows really prominently on there research, education, um, and professional development. And um, every UTC has a focus area, so that's what's guide, you know, inspiring and guiding the research that a UTC is conducting. Um, and then the education component is about enhancing existing courses, developing new courses. Um, it could also include um, putting on seminars, workshops, um, scholarships for students, forums for, for students to share their work. Um, so it's, it's community college, university level, um, and also K-12. That's part of you know, focusing on K-12 education and inspiring the next generation of 
road safety professionals, um, that's, that's part of the uh, purpose as well. And then professional development, this is the tech transfer piece. So um, this is, you know, as part of our focus on growing the next generation of uh, multidisciplinary professionals that are focused on uh, a safe systems approach to road safety, um, giving them the tools and the continuing professional education um, that, they, that they need. So working with universities as research partners, um, one way um, that agencies can be involved in that um, is through routine data collection. And so you could either um, engage a university at the outset um, if your agency or organization has a research idea and you want input on your data collection plan or your research plan. Um, and, or maybe it means reaching out once you have a certain data set or something that you're trying to understand and saying, um, we need help figuring this out. And so this, I'm saying this could be with you know, any university or a university that's part of a UTC. Um, and then also, if your agency is doing a really good job um, collecting data to make that available, um, one example that came up at the recent <coughs> UTC conference in Buffalo was um, the city of Austin's open data portal that um, researchers have been um, really digging into. Um, and so if that, I would take a look at this and see, I know lots of communities have their GIS data online, but I think this, this goes the next, the next step um, in terms, I should have, sorry, I should have actually probably taken a screenshot of what was within the transportation bucket, but that can be your homework. <laughs> Um, and then uh, another way to work with universities is through engaging students. Um, so <coughs> serving as a guest instructor, being on a, a panel, um, you know, a career panel, or taking advantage of student labor, just like the example of how a UTC might be able to pick up an offshoot of a, a research project you're interested in. Students could also be the ones to pick that up if there's some type of supplemental analysis that you'd like to do. Um, and, and then this is also giving those students some research experience or some practical experience um, that will serve our field going forward. So um, with that, I guess I'll open it up. Um, if you guys have any questions about what we talked about today, um, we're happy to share what we know. And if we don't know, we probably know who to ask. Or maybe there's someone else in the room who does know. So what are people uh, are there who works for a public agency? And consultants? I'm, I'm, I work for the city of Little Rock. Okay. Um, federal, federal agency? Um, so I guess what you know, what brought you here? What what is the what Yeah, the why why did you why did you want to hear us talk at you for an hour? <laughs> I, I'm an academic. Um, actually by training I'm a biologist so um, I my career path has been kind of strange but uh, I, I have a lot of the data analysis and uh, statistical background to actually be able to leverage some of those skills with some of the things I'm doing now I wanted to see how that might play out so. Yeah, we wanted to, I think, Kristen just hit on it at the end, but we really wanted to emphasize, especially for those of you that are public agencies, the value of the data you're collecting, making it public, you know. I know what you forgot to say earlier, or that any of us forgot to say <laughs> earlier. Um, the opportunity to participate on research panels, or, oh, yes. or um, so many of these research products that we shared, a lot of those um, FHWA resources, and then the NCHRP studies, well, NCHRP, NCHRP, you have to have a, a panel that's overseeing your research, but many of the other ones also have expert or technical if, advisory. If, yeah, if you're, if you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm an expert, um, you're a practitioner and you're the end user for a lot of those um, guidebooks that are being put out. So those have all, you know, there's all been, all of those have had panels that have guided, you know, what the final product was. So we wanted to mention that today as an opportunity to. Um, part, that's a way for you all to participate in the research. So through the think about the life cycle, I think um, in the spring every year, Ashto selects which NCHRP projects are going to be. Have this right? Which, which ones are going to be funded, and then yeah, and then they usually put out the RFPs later that year. You can actually have an any time the rest of that year. Um, 
But in between there, they're selecting a project panel, and there's an opportunity to nominate yourself to be a panel member. Um, and I don't know what, what time of year that call is. You, there was just one that just went out. Yeah. yeah. So and probably spring. Now, yeah, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's the other thing. But the, so that's one. But the, the federal research projects, at least the ones that I've been involved with, um, it's much less formal a process. We're just we often have a task at the beginning of our project to identify technical work group members and. Um, we, we're just relying on the collection of our joint knowledge of who's doing things in the field that are relevant and um, you know, making connections and conferences like this would be a good place to sort of get some your word out on that. And the other thing that I would think you can help us do, so I think it like kind of goes both ways, like us saying like please give us your research, like if you, um, if there's a university that you think is doing really great stuff but they don't really talk about it much or what they're putting out isn't really accessible, it's just very technical, like tell them. Because it's, um, it's, it's the duty of UTCs to really do that tech transfer. And just as like with practitioners, you spend the time like really doing the implementation and the evaluation secondary, I think with research, a lot of times, like research is, is first and foremost and dissemination becomes secondary. Um, and it's through, like I know at us, like we were just, um, just hearing from people and say, you know, we know you're doing really great stuff, but we just don't hear about it. Or, um, you know, we really want more policy briefs or whatever. Like just hearing that from people um, is a really, it's really helpful and it's also powerful because um, just similar, like, you know, there might not be an evaluation position or you really have to kind of lobby in your organization to get the funds to have someone that does evaluation. Similarly, universities, it's, it's hard to make the case sometimes that you should have someone that just does dissemination. Um, and that's a lot of big part of my job and I really enjoy doing it. Um, but sometimes it's really hard to make that case when you have a lot of other priorities, unless there's people telling you, uh, we want to know more, we want to use your work, um, you know, what you're finding in our work. So I think it can really go both ways that to make it really more connected between research and practice. And that's definitely something I've really been interested in getting and trying to do in APBP. And um, I think we have a lot of great resources and we can just kind of amplify that even more. Behind the mirrored column. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a transportation engineer, um, but I'm also, when I do a lot of work with research, I work for a company. I work for a company that works with NHTSA a lot. We do a lot of human factors work, so some of my experience has been with that. So we've um, done a lot of ID, IDIQs on pedestrian and bike safety, but I'm also in the process of, I'm like two years into my PhD, um, so I was hoping to. Um, and I guess I didn't read the session as much, but was hoping to see kind of the direction of some of that research because um, my dissertation is coming out here, so there are going to be some connections I can make at this mm -hmm. conference because I'm doing it on um, bicycle safety and um, that kind of work. So, um, you know, coming to this, it was interesting kind of hearing the three different directions or areas that you guys are in, but also um, I guess I have a lot to talk to you guys on separate occasions about what, what exactly you do at UNC, um, especially because you do bike and pet safety, and that's all I do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of safety stuff that's coming out of everywhere. There's also kind of like a Vision Zero National Center, or like at the Virginia Tech. It was like, cool. a, yeah, I don't know. I got, I got confused on it because it was like really, their map was working really well. Um, and I went to Virginia Tech. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's, you can see, like, you know, I would definitely, like, start with, you know, just looking at the centers that are the safety centers uh, as a great place to start. Um, Have you gone to TRB? Yeah. Yeah. Probably for the past 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that's like, I mean, the thing is, if my company really does mostly research stuff, um, I'm really the only consultant that does work for, like, VDOT. I do, like, traffic safety studies um, and traffic <laughs> The, the bicycle committee is charged with figuring out what the research direction in bicycle transportation is. So that's a, a great place to get a finger on what. Yeah, the problem is, is getting onto the actual committee is really yeah. hard. Yeah. The past few years, they've tried to get on it, and people just they don't want to leave it. Um, yeah. So I think the subcommittees are a great way to start. Um, so and that's where the meat of you know um, discussion on research needs and everything mm -hmm. takes place. So I would start at the subcommittee level. The bicycle committee has like five or six subcommittees. Some are specifically focused on safety. 
and so start there, start volunteering, you know, help with uh, paper review and any other tasks like volunteer yourself for writing an RMS. And uh, the, the committee, before you get on the committee, they want to see um, how You're much committed. you volunteered and committed, so I think I would start there. Okay. There is a bicycle research subcommittee to the bike committee right. in particular. Yeah. In particular. Yeah. Uh, but it's just it's Jamie's Jamie has a little chair there. Krista and Rebecca. Krista and Rebecca. Krista, yes. Krista, Norvac, and Rebecca Sanders. Go on. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I mean, like, you know, we, it's, universities, like, they're, a, you're trying to kind of shoehorn, every faculty member has their own, like, individual research kind of interests, and, like, you're trying to just kind of figure out, like, what actually ties them together, and sometimes it doesn't really make sense. Um, so like at UCLA, we just went through a, a trying to a, more or less effectively a, a branding process. So we could really say, okay, what does UCLA really do in terms of research? And we came up with public transit, um, transportation finance, and innovative mobility um, as ones. And so it's 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 kind of difficult to understand. I think totally because there's what you say you do to be part of a UCC. There's what individual faculty members do, and then like what your center or small unit by trying to be due just to make it very clear to the outside world, and they don't always line up perfectly. Well, and I also struggle too because, you know, I was learning a lot of the process. I did my master's, it was very different. They kind of spoon feed you a little bit when you do your master's, they give you your project, and as long as you do your thesis, it's fine. But with the dissertation, I've been, with the dissertation, it's so different. You know, they, you've got to go find your data source and you've got to figure it out. So. You know, there's tons of researchers that I would love to do work with, but they're all at universities and they all want the research for themselves and their students. So it's like this tough situation at the end that I feel like I want to reach out to places like Peter Firth um, and um, I can't think of her name, but uh, Portland Center yeah. for a lot of yeah. Jennifer Dill. Um, I would love to work with them, but I'm sure they're saving most of their research to do their own papers. Or for their students. For their students. Yeah. So I struggle at times. Um, and I work with Ralph Buehler. Um, he is one of my advisors, but um, he's also a planner, so it's a little different with a civil engineering, a PhD, that um, the data sources that you need in order to accommodate like three or four publishable papers. Um, I struggle at times finding where I can get that data, so I was hoping maybe coming to this um, conference that way. Okay, so what, what type of data? What so I mean, I have some um, bike share data for DC that I'm going to hopefully correlate a little bit to um, traffic stress and figure out pockets of holes of DC and determine modeling for cyclist routing. Um, but going from there, I don't know. Yeah, so um, there's, well, NAC started at NACTO, but then it's actually like a third party that is trying to just be the place where all bike share data in the US is going, so that you're not going to individual cities. I don't know, I don't think they're gonna launch, I talked to someone earlier this year, they're gonna launch that at some point. So um, that's one of them. If you're interested in like counts, um, there's kind of a small group of us that work a lot in the counting space and kind of know each other. So if you're interested in volume data, I'm happy if that's something I'm not doing right now, but done in the past and connects to other people in that one. Um, but yeah, there ends up being these kind of like small consortiums, maybe it's part of TRB and you kind of get to know them. But yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and I get that, I guess it's reaching out to the right people because a lot of times the data isn't public. Um, you kind of have to go through and know bike share <coughs> through DDOT and you actually have to know somebody that to get it, and even when you go to request it, there's such a hesitation of giving that, that information out because, you know, a lot of times they're, they're hoping to save it for some sort of research or project that they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, you just say, uh, DC area, Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, first of all, they produced a, their planning department produced a bike stress map of all the roads in the county. Yeah. And they also have bike share there, much smaller scale than DC, but uh, you know, I don't know how cooperative they would be for data sharing. Yeah, so they actually just did a research paper that they submitted to TRB comparing traffic stress in Montgomery. I think it was, was I can't remember, but a consultant yeah. ended up doing it for, um, for it, and 
it was an interesting paper, but that's kind of the direction I want to go with. But I know that um, DDOT just actually did um, a, traffic a traffic stress map for um, you know, the Washington DC, DC 3 Oh, so. the whole area? What? The whole area. The whole area, which it's actually pretty simple because, um, well, I think it's interesting. I think there are some flaws to the traffic stress uh, methodology that it's too easy to characterize what it was that I think, um, really need to be evaluated at a deeper level in order to determine what stress riders are actually using. Well, they, they use you know quick and dirty what they can do with the data. Of course, yeah. and so that's what they did. They reduced a lot of the roadways and the research that was done based on uh, data reduction by eliminating things like affecting if roadways are above like about 35 miles an hour, they automatically get um, you know classified as level four, regardless of any of the conditions that are present on the actual roads. So. Uh, Dan, Dan, Dan up here has you can't see, but oh, has hands up. So, uh, <laughs> I so one of the things, you, Matt, you got to earlier was the, the whole issue of just kind of being really um, thinking about what you can collect and what you can actually do with with respect to evaluation as a city, maybe like. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has a lot of funding to build out a whole position, but I'm wondering, is there a good set of guidance for just a city that a city can pick up and say, if I'm the only person who's going to be doing this, what can I look to to say, these are all the things I need to be collecting for these projects that I, like a good evaluation guide, basically, for, for a quick and dirty kind of thing. Uh, you just gave me a research idea, so I don't <laughs> think that exists. Or CVIC product. <laughs> No, I think it's, yeah, there's not that menu. I haven't ever seen that menu, and it would it could be really helpful. I mean, just as, you know, putting it out there, if anyone would like to just, you know, just even sketch that out, I think, you know, it would be really helpful. Because there's certain things, there's also, like, ways that you could be putting data collection programs you already have to more work, and that, I think, is a big part. Like, I always think the congestion management program, like, it's it's a, it's a huge missed opportunity that that is, the people, the cities are always only collecting traffic data, the car data, when they're doing those programs. And that's pretty much the best source that we have for a lot of different things. So when uh, we did a, a product project about bike pad data collection, we actually just wrote a chapter about like how to even just like kind of add on bike pad data collection um, to your consultant. Um, because you've already done so much of the work of site selection. And even though those may or may not be the perfect sites, at least you have some kind of consistent data over time. Um, but it's really, I, I think it's really hard because we're not, A, we're putting a lot of, um, we're, we're trying to have transportation projects do a lot of things that they may not be actually be able to do. Um, but even with, when you can do the project, I mean, you know, the counts, speed surveys, I don't know, what do you guys think of other things that like, if you couldn't, if you could only collect five things, what would you advise people to collect? Mm -hmm. For bike fit. Yeah. That counts all the time. I'm yeah. I get stuck on that one. One that I know I'm, I'm not going to answer my own question is <laughs> like CMF development. The biggest missing piece that you don't often have is installation date. So <laughs> cities don't have any clue when they actually do it. So even just yeah. capturing, I installed this round this road diet on you know, May 12th. Well, that's that's well, that's well. Before and after, right? That's the thing that always. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So my colleague did a project last year trying to put together our bike pen, um count database with the, um, the traffic injury mapping system. So that's the, like, how this California has the great, our great chance that we actually have a statewide um, database of all the collisions, and to actually put those two together because um, there's anecdotal and like some pretty good analysis saying that like when there's more people, you're gonna have less collisions, but these two data sets really haven't been put directly together mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. And one of the biggest problems she had was trying to find places like before <coughs> and after installation and it just became like a real headache and just, luckily it was a funded research project that she could throw money at graduate students to sit there on Google Maps and the time slider. Um, <laughs> just like to look at that, but that's ridiculous. Like we should, so I think that's, the, that's another great one. It's like, there's things on like the use side, which is like, I think counts and collisions are like yeah. the things to do. Um, and then on the infrastructure side, it's I like- I think people speak though too. Yeah. Um, yeah, then yeah, vehicle speed change 
uh, and then infrastructure data installation. Um, even just, if we just had those three things, I think we'd know a lot more about the effects of the work that we're doing. So we're, we're um, kind of helping to manage the health program in Central Florida, the Orlando area. Um, and one of the things that we're being asked to do is, it, um, is what can we get out of these counts? And they're, they're trying to do it year to year. And we're trying to, and we've been kind of throwing out a few things that have been pretty useful as far as uh, bike lane usage, when there is a bike lane and when there's not, or sidewalk usage, like are the cyclists riding on the sidewalk, things like that, and how, what percent is that. But <clears throat> I was wondering if you all knew of any other um, kind of continual annual count programs that were looking at trends over a period of time um, about specific design elements and how they might be incorporating those into um, priority decisions or anything like that. Um, any, any agencies that are doing kind of a long-term research, so to speak, um, already. I know it's, everything's kind of pretty young when it comes to count, <coughs> like the count programs right now, so there's probably nothing there right, right now. It's finalized, but if there's any programs that you know of that are kind of in the process of that. I mean, Portland has that famous chart where they, because they had a permanent counter on the Morse, uh, Hawthorne Bridge for well, since the early 2000s, and it's a sort of unique case where you've got a good proxy for regional volume, or traffic, you know, bike use growth. And so they put that chart up against the crash chart to yeah. show up balance, but that's more of a nice, so Portland is one, which I'm, I'm, I suspect you talked about. Are you saying using volume data to arrive at prioritization yeah. um, for a project? Prioritization or even or even design elements to be inclusive, so, um, kind of saying okay, it's it's almost behavioral to like for us we're saying okay if there's a bike lane you know how much is that really influencing people to not ride out the sidewalk? Mm -hmm. How much is really speed influencing that more than anything? And honestly, kind of those simple answer that for just count. Yeah, yeah. It just counts. Yeah. Uh, I'll just well, I was just wondering if you have any other program or any mm -hmm. other agencies that are kind of trying to look at those kind of design decisions in the long term? Um, I mean, I think the state of Colorado and Minnesota both have pretty robust statewide count programs. Um, I know that, I mean, I think it's the, I want to say it's the Colorado DOT that, that has one, um, and also MnDOT, but uh, for Minnesota, but I don't necessarily, I mean, I think part of this is that the state DOTs actually have a lot of research money, um, but the local entities are the ones that are making the decisions. Um, and there's not a lot of dialogue, I think, there, um, which is, I think we could tune a whole other session about. Um, but so, yeah, I would, I would look into those programs, at least, to start to see, uh, at least at like a statewide level, like what types of things they actually looked at. Um, I know that the, both of them have really strong university partners, too. Yeah, and I think DVRPC. Yeah. Uh, mm, yeah. Yeah. Has, uh, yeah. Scott Brady has a very robust uh, program, and he's been uh, collecting a lot of accounts and doing mapping and things like that. But I think you bring up a really good point. I've heard from a lot of people like, okay, we are collecting all this data now. What? So I think one of the things that I have personally explored is like looking at you know even things that you can get from signal infrastructure like you know, bike counts, pedestrian actuations, and then relating that back to signal timing. Like how can we improve like the timing for these uh, active modes? So that's one thing. And in research, we also often use counts for uh, safety analysis. So that's a big one. A lot of times there are gaps, like we do not have counts on a lot of places where we want to look at safety. So. So what are the things you know, you could use for that as well mm -hmm. to analyze yeah. safety? So I think those would be the two big things, operations and safety. Are you sure that wasn't a session in the program? I've got data now what? I feel like I've seen something like that. <laughs> yeah, well that's what then I doubt I'll be talking on our program and what we're doing. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Your session. okay. <laughs> That's our so, so we are trying to do stuff with oh, it. I was just okay. wondering if you guys had, had known of any other okay. um, places around around the country that were doing some pretty cool things with their data. So. Yeah. I will also introduce Sarisha as a researcher at Portland State mm -hmm. University. Was <laughs> yeah. that question? Left? Yeah. So we're starting um, a short-term count program in New Mexico, uh, and we don't have any permit counts in like 
like a statewide Albuquerque has some stuff. But my question is, is there research to extrapolate, better extrapolate to like yearly averages like they do with, um, with cars with, at the bike level? Because look, you know, when I was here two years ago, that was sort of not, I think the research was happening, but it's still, can, so can I ask you, a follow-up question? Why do you want to extrapolate? Huh. From the short term? <laughs> What's the purpose? That's, that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, so I, 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 I this is a tongue cheek, but true. I mean, I, I think that there, there, is, there isn't that much. I mean, about the short term because I'm just not, I'm not sure what that extrapolation value tells you, um, versus like what you can like. Do with the short term. Do with the short term and more see kind of relative so, intensities at different locations. So do we need to have permanent stations? Yes. To come so up with your own like adjustment you factors. Yeah. yeah. That right. are, so you're not using adjustment factors from like Minnesota or somewhere. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but a few, I mean, you're, you're going to have, if you can have a few, and I'm not the count expert, we all can put you in contact with yeah. volume data collection experts, but, um, you know, if you have a few permanent counters and then have the short duration counters in more mm -hmm. locations, mm -hmm. that's the that's the ideal scenario. I, don't, I couldn't tell you a minimum. I'm trying to remember the NCHRP report number. 797. Are we putting the cart before the horse then? Prior to getting, uh, I mean, having short term program prior to having a uh, permanent counter. Well, not yeah. if this is what got your foot in the door yeah. to yeah. have your agency support this, I would yeah. take it back to they you. They look at my but... up, watch up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so well, the, the LA County Public Health Department did a, what I think is a really great model. They bought a bunch of mobile counters, um, or like they more, I think they kind of like bought services from Eco Counter or something like that. So they put, they gave, they gave different cities um, in the county uh, two, pneumatic tubes and the pyro box for two weeks, um, and then just put them out for two weeks. And we learned, and then we did we did some data analysis for them, and we just learned so much more. Because we could actually come up with certainty um, for those figures just by having two weeks, and we did, they didn't really need permanent lifetime counters there. So that's a nice in between. And who is that? Where did you do it? So it's um, LA County Department of Public Health. So they're counter loaner. Counter we also that's who we also yeah did we got we bought or um, the MPO bought ten pyro boxes mm -hmm. and rotated them around throughout the year and ended up getting fifty five locations mm -hmm. uh, monthly counts. And, and then, you know, obviously there's some limitations with that and things like that, so you have to do some manual and or, and or two counts, but. Yeah. So we're gonna loan them out. I mean, that's the idea. Oh, that's the idea. So you're gonna put them in, you're gonna put them out for a couple of weeks, or? Like terms of you, we're, I'm working on like big grants <laughs> and all that crap, but, um, but that's the idea, is to, to loan them to um, RTPOs or MPOs mm -hmm. to disseminate them by, yeah, I mean, I think the extrapolation factor is a bit of certainty. So, like, you can know, like, your number is true. I think you can get there um, through through uh, just doing a week or two right. uh, in a way that's, I think, more interesting than okay. taking a two-hour or taking six two-hours, which is <coughs> reality. I mean, that's most of what LA County data is, are these short-term two-hour windows, um, and that's what we have. But by looking at these other ones, we saw just really interesting stuff, particularly about, like, school and the school travel stuff, like that was, that was really exciting to see because if you have a location by a school, it's not going to show, it's, it's like school release usually before the peak, so that doesn't even show up in your data whatsoever. And we had a school in a low income neighborhood had 2,000 kids walking every day. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that was just a huge peak. I mean, there was more, there was more kids walking than there were cars on the street. Mm -hmm. And had we had done this at a peak period, it would have totally missed that. No, and when you do a 24 hour count, you can get a lot of surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, Woodrow Wilson Bridge uh, across the Potomac um, near Washington, D.C. It's uh, Interstate 95. Uh, but when they rebuilt it, it include a bike path, permanent counter. The, the lowest usage level is at 11 p.m. It goes up after midnight. And why does it do that? Transit shuts down after midnight. Mm -hmm. It's the only way you can get from your job at National Harbor to your home in Arlington, or mm -hmm. Alexandria. So the narrative. So, uh, so yeah, I, I don't think anyone's actually been out there doing a survey at three in the morning to find out why are you biking right now. But if you're just doing daytime counts or, or just a short count, you completely miss that path. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're going to go on a weekly basis, we one of the perceptions myths we were trying to speak to uh, was uh, okay, 
yeah, nobody's traveling during the weekday, uh, especially in Florida, it's too hot. Mm -hmm. uh, they only do it for recreation on the weekend. And, um, and sure enough, you put out your counters and it's 50 50. You know, you have the same amount of people traveling on the weekday as you do on the weekend. So it's, yeah, it's the little things about it, even if it's just for a week. Um, a one week count, so you just Monday to Monday. And or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, two, you, if you can do it two weeks, it's best because in case you get like, we had um, rain. Rain, well, we don't have rain. Um, <laughs> but uh, like, we had issues with um, there was truck volumes and sometimes the, the tubes got tore up. So That's, if you, so we you did you, that too. And, yeah. And put it on a fairly high volume road and they just got. Yeah. And I don't know if it was our installation hardware. Maybe we need to change that up, but yeah, it just yeah. So that that was definitely something, and that's really tricky because particularly in like low, you, a lot of low income communities, the only streets they have are arterials that are truck yeah. routes. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's an easy safety case to make there. And you haven't you haven't checked it out. This would be oh, a okay. great resource to yeah. But even oh, this I one, so this one even I mean, but so the bike counting space has progressed, I mean, not to the point of extrapolation factors, but has progressed so quickly, <laughs> particularly in the technology the side. Technology I mean, so this came the, out. The, 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 the process, process, process. The process. Yeah, 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 yeah. Creating a program, yeah. yeah. Right. But I don't know, even in this one actually talks about like this kind of middle ground of like a count loaner program. No, I think it really has like short-term counts That's and permanent right. counters. There's not right. a lot in that space, but it'd be awesome just to like figure out who's in there. I think that's a perfect compromise. 